Stanford University. Today's class session is on the future of medicine. We have Tim Mills joining us here today. Quick context is that we've seen some pretty incredible innovations in medicine over the last 50 years. These include eradicating smallpox, learning how to transplant organs, even creating artificial hearts. And in the past year alone, we've been able to develop multiple vaccines to COVID-19. And we're going to be exploring today some of the recent advances in medicine and also what the future holds for us. Quick background on Tim. He's currently managing director of the venture capital fund Sanderling Ventures. Sanderling, for those of you who don't know, is one of the oldest venture funds in the biomedical space. It was founded in 1979. He has over 25 years of experience in venture capital investing, corporate management, product development, and biomedical research. He's participated in probably, I think the last count I had was over 20 companies. I'm sure that number just constantly keeps increasing every single year with various different areas such as biotherapeutics, medical technology, personal health care. He's um, served a number of roles prior to joining Sanderling Ventures. This includes being corporate VP of new business development and also chief scientific officer of Target Therapeutics, which was a medical device company that was acquired by Boston Scientific for a little over a billion in 1997. He's held a number of other roles on the business side, most um, significantly in business development and advanced research development. And finally, he's also held a number of roles in academia, including roles at UC Irvine's Medical Center, UC San Francisco's radiology department and Stanford's biodesign and spark programs. Tim, thanks for um, joining us again for this class. Tim is a class favorite in terms of discussing the future of medicine. We'll start by discussing some of the recent advances um, in medicine as it relates to COVID-19, AI and ML, especially with AlphaFold as well as CRISPR. And then we'll talk about a few other topics. So thank you, Tim. Well, thank you so much. You know, I really enjoy and find this an honor to be able to be part of this. I think the future of medicine, we are at a unique time where our future is real in that I think we're going to see massive changes. We've learned in the past 20 years more about our human biology than we have in, I think, collectively all the years before that. So I think that, you know, we are coming through a kind of a wormhole of trauma that has happened to us over this past year. You know, we were saying when we first joined the call today that uh, a year ago, if we would have said that, you know, we'd be in the same, maybe not boat, but maybe in the same water a year from now, I, I don't think any of us would have taken that bet, but we certainly are at this point. Um, not that much further from where we were before, but we've learned a tremendous amount. That stress, I think, will, you know, irrevoc ir irrevocably change the way we think of healthcare, the way we think of the need to be prepared, and to allow us to venture out into new areas, really, that we hadn't ventured out before. So I'm excited. Uh, to meet with you all again today and, and share some thoughts. So we have been in a global pandemic in the past year, COVID-19, and unlike last year's class, now we have vaccines developed for COVID-19. Can you share some of your thoughts on the topic in terms of how fast these vaccines were developed? Should we be concerned about how fast they were developed or how does this really affect how we think about treating future infections? Well, I, I think I see it as all extremely positive, maybe with one caveat. And, and what's positive about this is if you think about the two leading vac vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, both are an mRNA platform. And the beginnings of these platforms were really motivated from the initial, uh, and I'll just use the term SARS-1 infection, that you know, didn't really impact the US that much. It was probably more impactful in Canada as far as North America. But if you run the clock back on that, that was 2002, 2003. So what is, you know, what I think we were very fortunate to have happen was there were really, call it 17, 16, 15, whenever you start counting years 
of activity that allowed these platforms to really mature. Now, you know, the Moderna platform was really sort of a combination development done with support from the NIH. And then the Pfizer vaccine was really came out of primarily a, a very brilliant uh, husband and wife out of Germany. I'll just call it a biotech startup. And, and yet the, the nidus of these thoughts came from very different places. Their end results and their platforms are spookily similar. And uh, I, I think there is absolutely nothing to worry about in those platforms. In fact, you know, if you think about it, we gave them 17 years to figure it out. So I think time was basically on our side. The platforms are incredibly potent and flexible. The ability to take basically the genetic sequence of the virus and within 40 to 50 days have a vaccine ready to go is, is not because they cut corners, it's because they had the, the platform, the plug and play platform ready to go. So I think that not only is that great for getting us sort of out of this pandemic, but I think it, it sheds a kind of a new light on how we should be thinking about viruses and just say pandemics in general, and, and how important it is to have flexible platforms. You know, you would say, well, you know, why didn't, why weren't we able to do this for just standard flu vaccinations? You know, we, we struggle every year with coming up with the right sort of antigenic profile, and then they grow the flu vaccines, and then they get them ready. And then by the time people are getting their shots in the fall, you know, it's already the wrong strain of, of virus. But, you know, I would just say that, you know, need is the mother of invention, right? And, and when you have an, ex an extreme need, like what was really delivered by SARS-1, and, and luckily SARS-1 in some ways was more deadly than, than COVID-19. And that's why it, that's one of the reasons why it was able to be, be shut down and, and quarantined the way it was. But I think we're, I think because of this stress and because of, of this need, this extreme need, we're in a much better position now. And, and the, the last piece of this is really a BARDA. You know, BARDA is an organization that the government and all taxpayers support. And up until now, BARDA had always played what I thought was a very passive role in the pandemic preparation. And I'm hopeful that now after what we have all lived through that hopefully BARDA takes a much more proactive approach and keeps the proper stockpile and technologies and helps support those. Not just you know, giving you wishful thinking as a startup company that maybe Barta will buy something uh, if you basically raise all the money and develop everything for some other indication. And I'm hopeful that that changes. And I think that we have good reason to believe that it will. Mm -hmm. Tim, I'm glad you mentioned mRNA as the basis for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And specifically, are we going to see this technology now applied to other infectious agents like Ebola, Zika, and influenza, is the, as you term, need out there for that? Yeah, well, yeah, so, so first, I mean, and this is just, I think we all, if you have any sort of scientific background or, or perspective, I mean, everybody should be tipping their hats to these scientists, physicians, and staff members who were part of this development because it really is brilliant science. They were clever enough to look at the way uh, normal protein synthesis is done. And basically, you know, as, as we talked about in last year's class, do, do a biological hack and come up with something that could be used for a, a very specific indication. So, if you think about a little bit about your genetic biology, normally, you know, messenger RNA is something that is created through a transcription process, basically using the DNA in the nucleus of the cell to create 
a copy of some portion of that uh, genome. And, and that copy then finds itself or transports itself through the transcription process and gets beyond the nucleus. So it penetrates, or let's just say evolves to living from inside the um, nucleus to outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. And, and then, you know, the, the normal progression from there is, is that genetic material becomes the blueprint of the protein that is now going to be grown that has functional whatever it is, right, for functional resistance to bacteria, viruses, or just functional activities within that particular cell. But these researchers were so, were so smart, they said, well, why don't we come up with a way that we can put what looks like messenger RNA from outside the cell into the cell, but don't mess with the nucleus because we know that, you know, we start messing with the nucleus and, you know, you just open up more degrees of freedom of potential problems with genetic miscoding. But we can come up with our own messenger RNA equivalents and put that into the cell, into the cytoplasm, and then let the cellular engine work. And, and you know, to think about how you would sort of even imagine that you could do that, let alone do it. And albeit, you know, like we said, they had 17 years to figure it out, but nonetheless, it is brilliant and it is extremely effective. And so what, you know, the COVID was perfectly teed up for this, a plug and play activity. So they got the, the genetic, the genome of it. They, they looked at and used their sort of virology expertise and decided, you know, we don't want to be too specific on the way we encode this, but we want to find what we believe will be physical characteristics of the virus that will be unlikely to change through the initial mutations. And so this corona or this physical structure was, was and is the piece of the magic sauce here that makes all this work so well. And so I think that not only is this going to help us find our way through this current pandemic, but I also think you're right, it will be used for other, because there's no reason why you can't use this same cellular engine to create other things that you need in the body. And if you look you know, in the Moderna, if you look in their clinicaltrial.gov activity, they have two programs, both in phase two, both, one is in melanoma and the other is in CMV, cardiomegaly virus. And so I am sure that if either one of those turns out to be positive, which, you know, I think they've got a pretty good shot. I mean, those are both tough, tough indications, but if either one of those shows positive signs, then they have, I, I believe, a handful or so of other clinical trials that are currently in phase one. But yes, I think this will open the door to using this really elegant science to do other great things to treat disease. Mm -hmm. Another big force change from the COVID-19 pandemic has been telehealth. I'm curious on your thoughts on how did telehealth evolve during this pandemic? What's your prediction on the future of telehealth? Are there some major regulatory hurdles that we still need to overcome? Well, you know, isn't this interesting? Because this is that, you know, the mother of invention question, right? Up until this need, there was so much pushback on telehealth, even though telehealth seemed like inevitable, right? I mean, for, for at least a decade, we've been seeing probably you know, I would just say in our, in our venture firm, dozens of what I would call credible telehealth type of applications, but they were always, they would always get hamstrung on something like, you know, HIPAA violation or this or that. And so it was very difficult. Who's going to pay for this was, you know, another question, but it is funny how all those or let me put most of those roadblocks got all knocked down because we were at a point where we didn't want to, or at least didn't believe we should be seeing patients in the hospital setting. And if there was any way to do it outside the hospital 
We were going to move mountains. We were going to allow considerations that before were see, seemed to be insurmountable to suddenly vanish. And, and I think in the long run, this has set us up to have a much better health system in the future. I mean, one medical, if you, if you, any of you are familiar with that company, perfect timing for one medical, one medical is run by the CEO of one medical used to be the CEO of the Stanford health systems. He's a young, brilliant individual who kind of sees the need to have kind of a disassociated, small at home types of, of interactions which I think are, which we have thought for a few, maybe at least a decade, maybe some smart people saw it coming two decades ago, uh, the need and, and, the, and the absolute reality that will happen. And so, you know, what I think is the very fact that we're having this meeting instead of all, you know, congregating somewhere on the Stanford campus is an indication that there are things that have changed that will never be the same. I'm not suggesting we won't have this class in person someday. I hope we do. But that's the least of the concerns, right? I think that what this does is this sort of kicks open the door. And I think that where the real opportunity in telehealth is, is to start coming up with real sensors where you can do fairly elaborate things in your home that you would never even think about doing before because there was always something in the way. Somebody was going to claim a you know, HIPAA uh, compliance issue or nobody was going to be willing to pay for it or you know, it wasn't going to be a CPT code for the physician, blah, 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 blah. But I think that, I think that is behind us now. And I think what's really, there's no, I think the only limit ahead of us is how much technology can we develop? What kinds of tests can we do in the home setting? I mean, what kind of pictures can we take? What kind of measurements can we make? How can we get biological information from your home so that you could make a full diagnosis and you know have your medicine brought to your house in a drone? I mean, you know, it's not out of the question. So I think that these are the kinds of of questions that will be answered now because there'll be potentially venture capital and other capital willing to risk it because of the, the potential payouts and the benefit to the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another hot recent advancement in medicine is AI, ML, and AlphaFold. A quick context is that a few months ago, there's a Google-owned AI research company called DeepMind, which claimed to have solved the 50-year grand challenge of accurately predicting the structure that proteins will fold into. So AlphaFold is an AI program that was developed by DeepMind, which performs predictions of protein structure. Tim, can you share your thoughts on this breakthrough and why is this so important? Why should we care about this advancement in science? Yeah. So let me try to give you an analog. First of all, this is amazing as well. I mean, and let me give you the, the analog. There was a time back when the brightest minds in the world were trying to understand how electrons flowed through semiconductor materials. And, you know, this young kind of brash engineer scientist that was working for Bell Labs in, in uh, New Jersey, William Shockley, patented this new invention that he called the transistor. And the transistor was as revolutionary in some degrees in its time versus what the standard of, we'll just say, electrical engineering was, which were things called vacuum tubes that had an anode, a cathode, and a base. And, and what they would do is you controlled the output of these devices by proportionally controlling the input. And these technologies were mirrored or mimicked by these semiconductor devices, but it wasn't until Shockley kind of put it all together that you could build these things. And then the horse was out of the barn. People were trying to do bigger and, and better integration of transistors, but they struggled because they didn't have a simulation tool that was able to use form to predict function. And, and so 
what happened was there was a graduate student and a professor at Cal Berkeley who came up with the characterization of, and, and just think of it as the electron and hole mobility proportional to electrical field, sort of think of it as perpendicular to the direction of uh, current flow in the semiconductor. And they built a simulator called SPICE. Uh, and the acronym is really, you know, something like uh, simulator for integrated circuit electronics. And that revolutionized our world. The fact that we have a calculator, you remember the early HP calculators that had more computer power in them than, you know, the first computer that NASA had to track the you know, first Mercury manned space launch in a handheld device run on batteries. And, and look how far we've come from there. Look at the, 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 multi, the multi levels of development that's, that's gone on since then in microprocessors, in signal processors, digital signal processing. The only reason we can do that is because we can build arrays of electronics, arrays of transistors. That's really what drives all of this stuff is high density packing of transistors that can be characterized and simulated. And so that has changed our world to a point where we're not even really aware of that technology anymore. And I, in this situation with AlphaFold, I think is as revolutionary and potentially even more than that because the biological world is more uh, complicated than the three-dimensional world, or maybe four dimensions, uh, when you think of current flow within a, a semiconductor device and transistor and high density for, for microprocessors and other things. And what they were able to do is they were able to basically create and predict from the form of a protein what its function is going to be. And in this case, the folding of it is, is its function. And so you can think about this in several ways, but ideally you can think about the way you could look at diseased proteins and you could see how they are folding compared to what the non-diseased protein should be. And then using the prediction model, you could work it backwards and you could find out where the defect is and to be able to either do genetic modeling or pharmaceutical modeling or electro modeling, many different ways to then get in there and fix the problem. Now that's on the therapeutic side, but what I think is equally interesting is that if you could, in the biological world, predict function through form, then you could go one step beyond that and you could say, I can predict form from the genome. So if you got to the point where, and this is kind of the next direction that this work, that they'll, they'll be going with this work, that you could basically identify the genome, you know, the base pair combinatory double stranded helix, you could, you could define that. And that, that in the, it has a lot of analogs in the SPICE model of transistors, you put in certain characteristics that would be like loading the genome in. And then you press the button, you run the simulator, and you get not only the, the form of what it's gonna look like, but also the function. And if you could do that, then, well, let me put this way, when we can do that, then you'll be able to design drugs. You'll be able to do medicines from, you know, we'll just use the term medicines because there'll be lots of different ways to intervene at that point, but you'll be able to not only treat disease, but hopefully eradicate diseases throughout all, all the different uh, phases of human life. So it's a big deal. <laughs> That's fascinating on how AlphaFold can affect our understanding of diseases, medicines, drug discovery. On the topic of AI and ML, there's been a lot of discussion on AI and ML's use case specifically in medicine, healthcare, as it relates to possibly replacing healthcare workers with AI and ML algorithms. 
What's your view on this issue? What are your thoughts on the future of that? Are there obstacles that we still face for the implementation of AI and ML in healthcare? Well, look, AI and ML are just an extension to the way we are interacting with machines and the way we are using, let's call it microprocessor-based systems that can be programmed or programmable based systems to help us be better at everything that we do. And medicine is, you know, no stranger to needing to do things better. I mean, every year there's some new technique that comes out to make knee surgery better. Every year, somebody's trying to figure out how to grow articular cartilage to make repairs in orthopedics better. Every year, people are trying to figure out how to cure cancers that you know, continually elude us. Every year, we you know, lose elderly uh, patients to debilitating dementia. So there is plenty of things to do. And so not only is healthcare a great and fertile arena, for the implementation of of AI and ML, but it will only make the lives of the practitioners better. Think about how silly that that thought is. And and I'm not suggesting that it's silly that you mention it. You, you You are speaking what you hear a lot of people say, well, gosh, isn't this going to reduce the number of radiologists who need to review pap smears, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, the bottom line is it will make their life much better. It will make everyone's life much better because they'll be able to do more. They'll be able to do more at a lower cost. They'll be able to do more better. And so at the end of the road, if you think about other technologies that have, that have entered the field, did the field of electrical engineering get reduced because we now have circuit simulators? No, it didn't. In fact, they are just able to simulate better and more circuits and develop more products based on that. When the, when the uh, stethoscope was invented, instead of taking a stick and putting the physician, putting a stick in their ear and putting the stick against the patient's chest, when they came up with a, with a uh, stethoscope, did that, did that make it so we, had to, we didn't need as many physicians to listen to you know, chest murmurs? No, it absolutely did. It made them better at what they do. And I'm a firm believer that this technology, this specific technology, is not going to disenfranchise anyone in the medical field, but it's going to make their ability to treat disease better, faster, and cheaper. Another recent advancement in medicine, CRISPR, very hot topic. Could you briefly describe to us what exactly is CRISPR? How does it work? Why is it crucial to gene editing, diagnostics? What are the major use cases? Just um, kind of a brief introduction of what exactly this is. Yeah, sure. Well, again, another incredibly fascinating area. And again, you know, a beautiful science, the way everything has come together. And if you think about it, I mean, the CRISPR technology in its simplest mode is a powerful tool for editing the genome. And you know, CRISPR, I mean, people throw, throw the name around. What does that stand for? It stands for clusters of regulatory interspaced short palindromic repeats. And so what does that really mean when you look into the genome? And the best way that I sort of think of it is it's a, it's a unique characteristic of the genome, almost like the way a song is written. If the song is written and it only had one verse, then if you tried to edit that verse, you could potentially get everything messed up. But because of this this acknowledgement or, or I guess scientific discovery that there are these clusters of (laughs) regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, then the song has multiple verses that sort of repeat maybe slightly different words. It repeats again, but this structure is unique. And this is the thing that's powerful. 
that you're able to, uh, to find that these specialized regions within these repeats of DNA that have two distinct characteristics, the presence of a nucleotide repeat, so think of it as these different verses to the song, and, and spacers, so that you can actually, you can define the end and the beginning of these repeats. And so the, the discovery continued, and it was, the, the next piece is, is, is as critical as the fact that the song has uh, different verses, but there's an enzyme called Cas9. So the, 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 the shorthand of CRISPR, you know, the name, is really CRISPR-Cas9. And, and this is special, the, the CRISPR, the, the, the palindromic repeats, have specialized stretches of DNA. And then the protein Cas9 is an enzyme that you can imagine acts like little scissors to go in, it matches with this DNA code, maybe like, you know, 20, 20 different base pairs or so, and then it finds through that matching, it finds where the stretches of DNA is. And then the Cas9 is, is an enzyme that cuts, cuts through both strands of the DNA. And then you have this, thus you, you've been able to effectively edit the genome. And now you need to, to, to fix that. If you just let the body do its own thing and you cut that chunk out, it's likely to not heal itself the way you want it. It's likely to create a mutation in, in when it heals. But the, the second real breakthrough was that they were able to fix by filling in that gap with a sequence of nucleotides. And so you just imagine you have a short strand of DNA as a template and, and that you could write in any gene that you want or correct any mutation. So it was really an identifiable discovery that the genome has these songs in it that have multiple verses. You can use this, gen this DNA template of what you want to, where you want to remove the problematic DNA. The Cas enzyme cuts through both uh, strands that piece comes out and then the backfilling or the healing with, with writing in any gene that you want to correct the mutation allows for the editing sequence to be complete. extremely powerful. Now, you know, why, why has CRISPR, you might ask, why is it, you know, is everybody so worried about it? Well, think about that mechanism that I just described is when you go in and you are, you've created this special DNA piece that is complementary to the, the, the genes that you want to edit. Remember, if that sequence of genes or that verse of the song shows up anywhere else in that animal's genome, chances are this is going to edit that spot too, right? Because equal probability. So where CRISPR works best is where you just have, I mean, ideally one location of this, of this mutation. And so I think that that's one of the issues as we look forward, where will CRISPR be used first? It'll be used in areas where, at least I think, it'll be used in areas where this material that you're taking out really only shows up in you know, at best one or very few places so that when you do this edit, you're going to edit all the places that it shows up. You want to have it only affect the pathological DNA that you're trying to remove and not remove something that you wish you had. Thanks for providing us with that overview. And it sounded like you were touching a little bit on some of the ethical barriers as well. Could you dive a little bit more into the ethical challenges, also regulatory challenges for further development of CRISPR. Right. So, and, and let me just try to put an umbrella over these because the, they, they are many. And, and the real issue is people don't want two things to happen. One, they don't want to have mutations come out of the process and make the patient worse than they are. And the other, the other part is 
that's on kind of one extreme. The other extreme is they don't want a functional benefit to then follow with some unwanted or off target characteristic change that could happen later in life, right? So I think that what's likely to happen is that if you target some of these diseases that we believe, at least currently, that they're more single foci of their problem, like as an example, but I, I think you know, sickle cell disease or thalassemia, anemia, diseases like that are believed, at least currently, to have their, if you want to call it a mutation, I would call it their, their you know, problematic DNA re more resident in fewer places within the genome. And so I think that the regulatory concerns for, the, for that type of work, I think, will be much more doable as assuming the science continues to point in that direction. If, if the science of whatever the disease is that you're going after sort of teaches otherwise that you want to cure, you want to change the color of someone's eyes from blue to brown, and, you know, by the way, you're, go you're going to put the patient at risk for a whole host of other things down the road, then the regulatory, you know, approval would be insurmountable. You'd never get that done. So there are technique modifications that are going on as we speak to make these systems better and better and better. You know, the, the, one of the concerns is that the efficacy of this editing is not 100%. And the off-target effects, or just call it mutations, are not zero. So that's why there's concern, and I think it's appropriate, but it's also, again, a, a science that I believe can be regulated in a way that we could treat some of these serious, well, I, I believe the blood-based disease are where, where they should start and, and could start in that area. And, you know, just imagine how powerful this would be is if you could eradicate sickle cell disease or thalassemia. I mean, to me, that's worth giving it a shot. Now, just for, for full disclosure, we have a company in our portfolio that's using CRISPR in a slightly different way. And this is, I think, well, the jury's out because we don't have it perfected yet, but we have a company that we basically are trying to treat type 1 diabetes by putting islet cells back into the patient. And you, and you might say, well, what do you mean back into the patient? Well, these are islet cells that we grew from uh, not cadaver transplants, but from stem cells, fully functional islet cells. And currently, we put them in a like a bioreactor, a small bioreactor, and we place this underneath the skin. And the bioreactor is there to keep the body's immune system from attacking the islet cells because the islet cells were made from human uh, cells. And so, you know, they have an antigenic profile that is not necessarily the host. And so that's not good. And the bioreactor is there to try to compensate for that. Now, in addition to the bioreactor cells, which once they're in the reactor, you know, theoretically doesn't matter if they have antigen profile or not, but we would like to be able to improve the growth of those cells and be able to work through a more porous bioreactor. So we're, we are in the process of using the CRISPR editing techniques to essentially not change the function of the islet cell for you know, diabetes or glucose regulation, but to basically be able to strip off the antigen profile so that in a sense, the cell has no, has no signature back to its initial cell or cell type, and that it could be transplanted into patients of all, you know, of all types, of all genetic material types without being seen as, uh, well, as being seen as, as the host tissue. So I'm sure there will be other technologies that will use CRISPR. And I think that the simpler the edit, the better. And the simpler the edit, 
I think the simpler the regulatory hurdles will be. Tim, thanks for discussing those recent advancements in CRISPR, AlphaFold, AI, ML, COVID vaccines, mRNA. I have a few other questions on emerging technologies. This one's from the class. What are your thoughts on the anti-aging space? What life extension technologies and rejuvenation methods excite you the most, if at all? And I'll let the student who asked that question also jump in with additional commentary. Yeah, I'm sort of just curious, like, you know, what therapeutics, you know, do you think are the most interesting? Is it like, you know, senolytics or perhaps other, you know, sort of interventions, you know, like stuff around, you know, metformin or other sort of drugs? I'm curious what, what your thoughts are there. Well, I mean, the area that is probably the most interesting to me are the senolytic drugs. And it's probably just because <clears throat> I know the least about them, right? The concept is very intriguing that you could somehow identify, let's just call it these non-dividing cell types and remove them. And in doing so, regenerate or rejuvenate the host cell and get it to function more normally. I, I think, again, th that hypothesis is alluring, right? Now, as we've started to go down that path, we have, I think, been both encouraged and discouraged. And so the, the, the issue is that the, let's call it handful of product that has been studied are mostly uh, natural product, right? Natural product or things that look similar to small molecules. And so the, the, the problem with, with small molecules is they're not very, oh, typically, they're not very specific in their targeting. So small molecules have the unfortunate side effect of off-target responses. And of course, the off-target responses always raise their ugly head as you start to increase the dose of the drug. And that is kind of what at least that we are what, of what we've seen as we've studied some of the different compounds that have been tried to use here. Now, the flip side of that is natural products usually don't have, well, I mean, usually is probably the wrong word, but oftentimes don't have off-target effects because they've sort of evolved over time to do certain things. However, they've also evolved over time to have a very narrow dose curve. And when I, I refer to the dose curve as a curve that allows for a dose to stay in suspension, to work within the normal biological parameters in the, in the uh, organism. And what typically has happened with these, and again, it's a handful of uh, different natural products, is to get them to function in, in the way that you know, this sort of, let's just call it classic analytic compound needs to function, the doses have to be increased. And as, and when you start messing with a natural product's dose, normally what happens, and this is what has happened in most of the experiments that we've been involved with is you can't keep them in suspense. You can't, in other words, they become undruggable. And so I've been both excited and disappointed in this, but I think it's certainly an area that we are trying to better understand and try to understand how we can learn and potentially support some activities to try to learn in this area because at least the premise or the thesis is very, very interesting that if these non-dividing cells are getting in the way of a more vibrant cell type, understanding how to extract that and get back the normal function, that's intriguing. Another question from the class is related to nanotechnology. And the question is, how do you think nanotechnology will impact medicine? Is it realistic to imagine nanorobots helping to repair damage in our bodies on a cellular level? If so, what is the time horizon for such inventions? That is a great question. And I, I think 20 years ago, this whole concept of a nano robot that could go into the coronary artery space and basically slowly, but over time, 
re remove arterial plaque, remove blood clots. I mean, this seemed to me to be something that would happen in our lifetime. Now, in parallel with those thoughts and developments as time went on, our basic understanding of biology has continued to improve. And so now I think that maybe what we're really going to see are biological robots, biological systems that have more of a physical mimic to them where their interaction, instead of having a little, just imagine some kind of nibbler that cruises around and looks for coronary artery plaque, that we have a, an infusion that a patient gets, you know, once every three months and it has a, a lytic solution that is carried in a, we could call it a nanoparticle or a liposome particle that is attracted because of different chemical characteristics to the plaque and, and or the ruptured plaque where the, where the blood clot is. And, and, and that, I would call that a biological machine, I think is probably more likely in our future. And it's not really because the, the nano machines didn't work. It's just that the biological systems, you get energy for free if you can make that work because they're living in a, in a, in a, sol, in a solute of, of energy. And, and, and having that energy is something that you know has always hamstrung nano machines because it's difficult to come up with solutions to that need. So Tim, I have one final question as it relates to emerging technologies, and this is regards to Neuralink. So last week on the new social app Clubhouse, Elon Musk talked about Neuralink and how they've already been able to get monkeys to play video games. Maybe a tough question, but how close are we to having chips implanted in our brains? Well, you know, I would love to, and maybe Elon's watching. So, you know, give me a call, tell me, tell me the answer and I'll report back to the class. So I really don't know, but it's extremely exciting. And, and the notion of how will the man machine interface evolve over time? I think absolutely. We will have the opportunity to do those types of physical modifications to help link us into our computer world or electronic world or virtual world. And so I don't really have the insight into how they're doing there with the monkeys, but I do have some insight into this area. So the, uh, this is about 10 years ago, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, had a very interesting patent, I would say sort of roundup. They, they took all their drug development subsidiaries and parent company, and they looked at what they were doing that affected nerves, right? I mean, a lot of drugs that we take don't necessarily affect nerves. They affect solid organs. They affect other components of the, of, of the body, enzyme releases. But what they did was they put these, all these together and then they, they filed a, a broad IP around many of them. And the idea was that instead of thinking of treating disease using pharmaceuticals, think about treating the disease use, using electroceuticals. And so the electroceutical assumes that you can do something to the nervous system. You know, in our simple-minded uh, approach, we th at least I do, I think of nerve interaction as neuromodulation of some kind. Uh, maybe you ablate a nerve, maybe you make the nerve conduction faster through some way, or you make it slower through some way. But this whole notion of, of electroceuticals, so, and, and a, a man-made interface into changing the way the nervous system responds in the body. And with the idea of GlaxoSmithKline knows because they developed a bunch of drugs that affect the nerves for certain diseases, they knew exactly what those diseases were. They knew the nerves that they were impacting, et cetera, et cetera. And they were out shopping it around to venture firms 
And for us, it was interesting, but overwhelming because it was so big and they didn't want to break it up into little pieces. There were certain pieces I was very interested in, but they wanted somebody to take it all. And at the time, the only group that really kind of had the wisdom and, and the, the stomach for it and the money was Google. Or, and and they at, it is now part of their Virilli franchise, and they have partnered with GSK and are working on these electroceuticals. And so there is no doubt in my mind that this will cross over. Elon's concept is very viable, and I think GSK's and Virilli's concept are very viable. There are ways to talk and read off axons. And there are ways to communicate to the outside world. And there are ways to um, treat diseases, but it is not for the faint of heart. And so some of the early work that I saw proposed for human to computer interaction were as simple as either implanting or having on you know, like the Google Glass, you'd have an accelerometer either in your glass or underneath your skin. And you basically, because it could detect motion in your head, you use the accelerometer as really a joystick to doing certain things. Now, that's a long way from what at least Elon has proposed that they want to accomplish. And certainly, I think a long way from where the accomplishments will ultimately become, but it is a super exciting area. And I think in our lifetime, we will definitely see an improvement in the way we interact with our virtual electronic universe.